Yeah, welcome to Think Tech. Uh, military in Hawaii, when talk about RIMPAC, that's, uh, what is that, um, RIM of the Pacific, and it's a military exercise involving dozens of countries, and it's happening, actually ending today. Today, or right about now, anyway. And, and we have James uh, Dobson. Uh, he is a lieutenant commander in the Australian Navy. And if you've uh, never met a, a lieutenant commander in the Australian Navy, you could call him mate. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> so, James, it's so nice to have you on the show, and I'm so interested in, in RIMPAC. Um, Ken, you know, RIMPAC is what, about 10 or 12 years old or older? So RIMPAC started in 1971. So we've oh, been wow. going for a while now. Uh, it started with uh, a trilateral exercise between uh, Canada, Australia, and the US. Uh, and like all things in the military, we decided that uh, we needed to grow. Uh, and, and we got a little bit uh, too ambitious in what we wanted to do. Uh, so from 1974, instead of it being done every year, we went to every two years. Uh, and, and it's grown steadily uh, from there. Uh, but what I will say is from about 2012, uh, we really opened it up to everybody around the Pacific to fulfill some leadership roles that have historically been held by the US. Uh, so in that sort of 2010, 2012 period, uh, we were sitting at about 12 countries. And from 2012 onwards, we've been averaging mid twenties uh, for the countries that have been coming on uh, and only growing from there. So it, it's been a really interesting uh, to see that growth path. Is Australia in a leadership position in RIMPAC? We are. So at the moment, uh, we've fulfilled the role of uh, the Combined Maritime Forces com uh, Commander. Uh, so in effect, our one star that we brought out here uh, was in charge of all of the surface units and maritime patrol aircraft uh, for the four weeks at sea. Oh, marvellous. Um, you know, it, it had 26 countries involved um, this year. Is that an all-time high? I'm not saying they're all active at sea. You know, with um, you know, uh, uh, either ships or aircraft, what have you. Um, but there are twenty six involved. Some are, some of are observer countries, right? Uh, can you give us a smattering of how of how wide geographically those countries are? Sure. So uh, we have uh, from Denmark uh, is probably our highlight, uh, and the UK. Uh, from that European uh, theatre we look at, um, all the way around to our South American countries as well. Uh, so, so we are growing uh, in scale and scope of the countries that we invite uh, and the integration and interoperability that we're really pushing for. Uh, so it's not just the rim of the Pacific countries. Uh, nowadays, we are really pushing into that uh, Indo-Pacific area and up through Europe as well. Yeah. Yeah, um, and so, uh, oh gee, a few questions about just exactly how you do it. So, first of all, when I when I looked a little on the web, I saw that um, there were more than there was more than one language involved, uh, because some some of these countries, um, either the principals or the observers, don't necessarily speak English, or is the whole thing conducted in English? The whole thing's conducted in English, uh, and that's just as a, a standardized safety language across. Uh, as you can probably imagine, trying to uh, having an English speaking country uh, controlling a, a foreign aircraft and working through the intricacies of those languages uh, is why we, we run the whole exercise as an English based language. Uh, that's not to say that we have uh, we don't have other languages here. Uh, in fact, uh, for the first time ever in a RIMPAC, uh, we had the Republic of Korean Navy uh, run our amphibious task group uh, and they bring a lot of interpreters so that that nothing is misconstrued uh, and everything's nice and clear and uh, conducted safely throughout the exercise. Yeah, they're an active player this year for sure. So is this, um, this group, um, is it fair to say this group represents countries who are either members of what we would consider the West or friends of the West? Uh, you know, how, how do you define your invitees? So our invitees or, or who uh, runs that ultimately um, rests with the US government. Uh, and we send out invites uh, for all of those countries that have participated before, uh, as we consider them like-minded partners. Uh, and, and talking through, I guess, why we run RIMPAC, and it's all about getting our like-minded partners together uh, so that we can increase our interoperability. Uh, and through no, uh, force or uh, specific outcome, just so that we know that we know how to work together. Uh, we know what our capabilities are 
and we know where these countries are best fit. Uh, so that at a pinch, we can come together. We know uh, some key individuals throughout the various countries uh, and we can really put together a, a cohesive unit. Yeah, I'd like to explore two things, what you said. One is interoperability. What is that in terms of, you know, the operations, uh, the exercises, um, you know, the, the daily um, schedule of events in RIMPAC? So for us, uh, and we, we build, uh, I'll answer this question, I guess, in, in a, a little bit of a roundabout way, and I'll apologize that, but it will make sense uh, as we pull through. But when we put the exercise together, we go out to the 26 countries. What exactly do you want to get out of the exercise? Who do you want to work with? What assets are you going to bring? Uh, and what are the training outcomes that you really want to get out of this? So my job is to collect all of that information together. Uh, and then from there, we build what the exercise looks like. So when we talk about interoperability, it's all about how do these specific countries and these units work together communicate together, to conduct uh, serials together, be that uh, live fire serials, be that anti-submarine exercises, any surface exercises or anti-air exercises, and who they want to do that with. Uh, and once we, we pull that together, we execute it like we have over the past four weeks here in Hawaii, uh, and we build capacity for the crews and understanding for the ships and the aircraft and the, the soldiers and uh, Marines that head ashore so they know how each country works together and how they can fit in and complement uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the other countries that do come along. So when we talk interoperability, it's putting all of that together and actually seeing that outcome. So uh, but it operates on the assumption that one day these countries may have to work together in a real live combat situation. Isn't that the fundamental point? It is, in effect, that, uh, and we, we exercise that such that when we do end up coming together, uh, if there is a, an operation or a, or a conflict that we need to uh, fight together with, we already have that baseline knowledge uh, and, and those key pieces or those individuals. So we know we can slot in with relative ease together, as opposed to working through uh, the normal group think of forming, storming and norming. Um, we've got that already. <laughs> Okay, the other thing that, that caught me from what you said was um, that, that the, the officers, uh, the men and women, they get to meet each other. Uh, and I'm reminded of APCSS, which is the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. It was established by Dan and Owe some decades ago um, in Waikiki. And, and what happens there is the DOD, Department of Defense, um, invites people from all over the Asia Pacific um, and they go to school together. They have various classes on security and what have you. And, and uh, they, they spend time together. They actually live together in various condos around, around Waikiki with the specific intention they should know each other. They should know each other going forward forever. And they should be able to pick up the phone, you know, 10 years, 20 years from now and be able to collaborate on things. Does that happen in RIMPAC? So we have a really, uh, a really unique success story uh, in this particular impact. Um, so, so I spoke about Australia holding that uh, leadership role. Uh, Commodore O'Grady uh, was our uh, maritime component commander. Uh, he actually went to the US War College with uh, the Humanitarian Aid Disaster Relief Commander, Admiral Harata, who's out here at the moment as well, and the Deputy Commander for the exercise, uh, Canadian Rear Admiral Robinson. Uh, so, uh, while uh, uh, AP uh, KSS does a fantastic job, it is, a, in fact, not just the only avenue that we do that. So our, our commanders for this exercise have already met each other. They've, they've gone through War College together uh, and they know how to work with each other um, from previous experience, which is excellent. And it makes running the exercise a lot better. Um, what we do on the ground, however, uh, and we spend 10 days at the right at the start of the exercise doing this, is getting all of the ship's commanders or the aircraft uh, commanders or the, the land component commanders together, introducing them to each other. Uh, and we do, we hold uh, a number of official functions throughout the period, uh, a number of training symposiums and safety briefs, uh, and they really get to know each other. So uh, if they need something while they're out at sea or, or something's perhaps not going like they would, uh, like it to, they can pick up the phone and they know who they're talking to. Uh, and that's been really key in developing those relationships. 
Yes, I think that's exactly what I was what I was thinking of. This is really beneficial on that level, if no other level. Um, the the next question that comes out to me is, um, you know, uh, having twenty six countries out there associated with the United States, uh, including you know all, all the the Western countries, European countries, and and uh, Australia, New Zealand, of course, um, you know, makes a statement. It makes a statement to everyone in the world, at least everyone who's watching, and a lot of people are watching. Um, so what statement is that? Uh, what, what, what kind of message does this send to, um, you know, the world order, so to speak? So when we put together RIMPAC, um, and particularly as we're developing our scenarios, um, there's no, uh, I guess, common enemy or co common opposing force that we're putting it through. Um, so the, our, our op for, our uh, opposing force, all made up of uh, RIMPAC participants. Um, so when we talk about um, building and putting all of these countries together, uh, you're right in the fact that a, a statement is made, but it is more of a generalist statement about, look at these 26 like-minded partners uh, who are all operating together and have the ability to be interoperable uh, and then bordering on at the end of the exercise, interchangeable, because uh, ultimately that's where we would like to go that the one-for-one -one swap of these countries that we work so hard to build these relationships with uh, and to be able to deploy at sea or on land or, or in the air with these countries. You know, every country has its own arsenal, its own fleet, so to speak, of aircraft, uh, submarines, uh, you know, uh, ship, surface ships, of course. And the technology is not always the same. I mean, I, I suppose the American um, military industrial establishment would like to you know, supply everybody with American things, but it isn't like that. I remember seeing a movie not too long ago about French submarines. And of course, the French always have to do it differently, right? So the, the French the French submarines are completely different than the American submarines. Uh, and so I imagine that a lot of these countries have equipment that's really different from the guy next door. Um, and from that, you know, you can learn, of course, you can learn what he has, you can learn how to do it better, maybe take home some ideas about not only the equipment, but um, you know, the technology and the systems. Am I right about that? Um, is, is that the way it works? Uh, do you ever have equipment envy <laughs> at RIMPAC? <laughs> I, I would say everybody has equipment envy when you look out here at the aircraft carrier and the sheer just size and scope of what uh, the American Navy and Air Force and Marines, for that matter, have put forward to the exercise. So, personally, do I have do I have uh, some military hardware envy for sure? Um, <laughs> but you raise a really good point in the fact that uh, when we we look through some of the challenges of pulling all of these countries together, uh, and, and not everything's created equally, and not everything's created the same, uh, and not everything talks to each other. Uh, so, so building this and building a, a cohesive exercise, uh, a significant lift goes on all of our communicators and, and uh, what we call our, our link picture, uh, so our common operating picture uh, operators, to push all of that information uh, out amongst the ships and the aircraft uh, because they don't talk together. Uh, and sometimes we need um, pieces of hardware uh, and we offer up um, some specific pieces of hardware for the ships so that we can all talk together from both a safety point of view and an integration point of view as well. Uh, so that, that I will admit is one of our biggest challenges putting through the exercise. Uh, but again, uh, and we held our closing ceremony uh, a couple of hours ago, um, everybody said that the ability for us to all talk, to work off a common operating picture is what makes us interoperable at the end of the day. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, and it's not only the equipment, uh, it's the systems and it's the, what do you want to call it? The mindset, the mindset, the approach that the officers, men and women would have based on their training, based on their experience in the service uh, of their country. And I wonder um, how that works. Uh, you know, you have a certain mindset. It's probably very similar to the American Navy mindset. Um, and Coast Guard, that's my affiliation. <laughs> but other countries may not have that mindset. They, they may look at the whole thing differently. Do you find that in RIMPAC? And what do you do about it? Do you, do you want them to think more like you or do you want them to understand how, how you think? Uh, 
are you are you getting together on on the mindset aspect of things? I guess we're all we're all pushing forward, uh, and I know I continue to use that the the buzzword of interoperability. Um, but from a a mindset point of view, um, we all want to be able to work together and get all of our systems connected and, and working well. Uh, and the way that we set our scenario up, um, we're all working towards that common goal of, in this case, we're defeating Orion, which is our fictitious uh, scenario uh, opposing force uh, throughout. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, the various countries that we get in, some are more forward leaning, uh, some are less forward leaning. Uh, and everybody's taken on that journey of, okay, how does the exercise evolve? What are your individual triggers uh, for moving forward? And then having those discussions at the senior leadership level, which is why it's really important for having a multinational leadership level to find out where everybody's comfortable and then ultimately a decision is made to, to move forward from there. Um, but the learning outcome, particularly at the headquarters level of, of where do the countries fit, who is more comfortable or not, what are your thresholds for, uh, for moving forward through the exercise, it's a really good teasing and learning outcome uh, for our headquarters staff going forward. Yeah, yeah, important to understand how the thought process differs from country to country. I mean, not everybody has the same education. Not everybody has the same view of the world, uh, either politically or technologically. So um, uh, you mentioned the, the brass. Uh, so who's running this now? I, I remember looking at old uh, RIMPAX and you had the, you know, the very senior brass, the Secretary of Defense, for example, was here in Hawaii. Uh, is that happening now? Uh, are secretaries of defense coming from various places? Uh, uh, and how are they collaborating together as the joint leadership, if you will? So uh, the exercise is headed up by Commander Third Fleet, uh, Vice Admiral Boyle. Uh, and, and he is the, the overall lead for the exercise. Uh, he, uh, under direction of Admiral Papara, uh, Pacific Fleet, um, puts it all together. Uh, and I am the person that um, helps putting it together uh, with a group of 24, 25 other people um, to, to pull that through. But that's not to say that we don't have um, some significant engagement from uh, US military leadership. Uh, so this time out, we had Secretary of Navy uh, come out as well. We've had CNO come out. Uh, and we've had CNOs from other countries, um, politicians, congressmen, uh, and staff come out as well. And, and it's these coincidental uh, conversations or bilats that are almost just as important uh, as the actual exercise itself. Uh, for, for various topics discussed amongst those senior individuals, uh, but it does provide a, a really interesting venue to do that too. So you mentioned with 24 or 25 individuals, um, you're actually executing the plan. Um, and uh, let me take a moment off and, and ask you, what qualifies you to do that? Uh, how do I get your job? Uh, did, you, did you attend Annapolis? What happened? So for me, uh, I am a, a surface warfare officer uh, by trade um, in the Australian Navy. Uh, my background, uh, I've done a little bit of navigation. Um, I, I've done a, a principal warfare officers course, uh, which for us from a, a Commonwealth perspective uh, means I can sit down and be a, a tactical action officer um, to sit in the operations room and, and drive the combat system. Uh, and also then an operations officer after that. Um, so my 11 years of experience at sea uh, covers off uh, on a lot of those aspects. Uh, and then I was, I've had the privilege of being selected by Australia to come across and embed at Third Fleet. Uh, so I live in San Diego to be able to put this exercise together. Uh, and it's been an absolutely phenomenal experience to do that. Is this a, is this a prestige billet for you? Uh, I think so. Uh, we went through a selection process to get here. so. Uh, I would like to think that that was the case, uh, but yeah, it's been fantastic. Okay, wow, I'm excited. Um, you said that only a few hours ago there was a ceremony, and I recall it was this week. It, it started, the program started, RIPAC started in early June. That's June and July, 60 days, I guess. And in early August, it ends. So what was the ceremony like a few hours ago where you closed it down? Uh, who was there? What did they say? Uh, so we take all of the leadership uh, and all of our uh, senior representatives from the, the 26 countries that are here uh, and the, the ship's crews, 
uh, the aircraft crews and, and the land component that are here. And we sit down uh, and we talk through uh, what the highlights have been for the, the countries that are here, um, whether they achieved everything that they set out to actually achieve, noting that it is a significant lift for a number of countries from assets, money and people to get here. Um, and, and then uh, any uh, further shaping that we'd like to do for, for RIMPAC 2024. Uh, so overall, uh, it was a resounding positive um, everybody was incredibly happy to be here. Uh, everybody achieved what they needed to do. Uh, and we just have minor tweaks moving forward about how we can make the exercise better uh, for 2024. Uh, what I will say though, is I expect it to be much larger, uh, noting that we've successfully completed it now here in 2022. Uh, and, and it's that, that message that we spoke about earlier, pushing through to saying, hey, we are doing this again. Uh, it is back to what it was in 2018. Uh, and we invite these countries to bring more people, more units, and increase that interoperability footprint that we have. Yeah, let's talk about 2020 for a minute. Um, it, it's kind of interesting it was COVID, and it, it really did change the world, at least for that period of time. And we, we all know it changed our lives, our businesses, what have you. And I guess it changed RIMPAC too. How did it change RIMPAC two years ago? It did. So we made it all the way through the planning process and we were doing our final confirmatory touches on it. Uh, when we, we got the call, look, we, uh, it's not a good idea moving forward with this because we didn't know what was happening with the pandemic at the time. Uh, so the decision was made that it needed to be conducted wholly at sea. Uh, we still conducted it though. And of those 29 countries that we had invited, 10 sent chips and, and units out here to complete RIMPAC because we wanted to send that message that we can still conduct a large scale exercise even during a pandemic. What that practically looked like, uh, we had ships come alongside uh, basically for fuel and food and stores uh, and then head back to sea. Uh, so no shore liberty or anything like that for, for the crews that were here. Um, but we still completed a three week exercise um, highly successfully uh, based on all accounts as well. Um, so yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, and everybody wore masks. That's it. That's right. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and touching on that though, um, so that means that, for example, ships of the Australian Navy would, would have steamed from Australia to offshore uh, Hawaii, offshore maybe offshore Pearl Harbor, and stayed there for the exercise. Did the exercise without without coming in into the the harbor, I guess. Uh, they were uh, re, re, resupplied at sea and then they left again. So you never actually touched Oahu in 2020. Uh, am I right? It wasn't quite that bad. Uh, we, we managed to, so the ships would pull in uh, and, and connect up alongside so that they could get their, all their fresh food and, uh, and fuel and the like. But uh, for 95, 98% of the crew, um, unfortunately for them, um, their, their view of, of Hawaii was standing on the, the forecastle of the ship and taking a photo. Um, and and I'll, I'll quickly, I guess, elaborate on that and the difference here. Um, when you look, here we are two years later. Uh, it's been incredibly heartening to see all of these countries come back in uh, to be able to, to get ashore, to be able to experience what uh, Hawaii has to offer and, and fully cognizant that we're guests here and we have this enormous footprint that we, we impose on uh, Oahu and, and Honolulu in particular um, for, for that sort of six to seven week period. Uh, it's been really heartening to see a lot of these uh, crews get ashore and enjoy what, what uh, this fantastic place that you have to offer. Yeah, what a difference between 2020, it's every two years, so the difference between 2020 and 2024, 2022. Um, I, I can imagine how happy the crew members are to come from wherever they're coming from and enjoy, a, you know, a tourist destination. I'm going to ask you this, you know, when they come ashore, is there any drinking involved? Um, I'm sure that they're enjoying the sights and sounds of Waikiki. <laughs> Uh, and I hope uh, I will admit that, that Waikiki is enjoying them as well. So, as I yeah. said, we're guests here uh, and we're, we are on our best behaviour, uh, but we, we certainly try and take advantage of, of the hospitality that you guys have here. Oh, that's great. That's really, that's part of RIMPAC, isn't it? It's yeah. the hospitality notion. It's the idea of, uh, you know, the crew having a good time and connecting up with another place, another culture and Hawaii, which is a very welcoming place, as you know. Um, so let's talk about the future, you know. Um, this is every two years, 
It will happen again in uh, 2024. Uh, as you said, you'd like to have it bigger. Will it also be uh, led by the Australians? Uh, uh, what, what's the arrangement going forward? Is, is there some kind of rotation going on? Uh, and, and how will it change in, in terms of um, you know, the number of ships and the interoperability? So moving forward, we, we have one final conference uh, at the end of this year, uh, and it's to really pick those leadership positions for 2024. Um, now, I can't say with any degree of confidence whether Australia will be in one of those leadership positions or not. Uh, that's up to Australia uh, to, to come up with. Uh, but what we do uh, and why we saw such a growth from 2012 through until now is that we offer these leadership positions up to countries, to, to any country. Um, we have a graduated process to get through, uh, but I would not be surprised if we see some, some other countries in those uh, leadership positions, not only because it helps develop our interoperability, but there are also skills and takeaways that they get to take home to their own country uh, to, to be able to, to better themselves as well. Um, yeah. One thing I will say is, so Chile in 2018 held the Maritime Component Commander and, and the, the skills and, and the activities that they uh, undertook while here at RIMPAC in 2018, they took home and, and revitalised and revamped a lot of their, their headquarters back in Chile. So there's, there's a huge return on investment for these countries moving forward. Uh, so what the, C, what, the, what the command and control looks like, uh, I won't be able to tell you until the end of the year and that decision's made. <laughs> Um, but what we will see, uh, as I was saying before, is that increase, uh, hopefully, in the ships, in the aircraft, and the people that are here. Um, just because uh, we can say that we've done it, we're, we're moving forward again. Uh, and the more ships that we have here and the more aircraft, the more complicated it is, but the better we become uh, from an interoperability perspective. Yeah, you know, they say the military, and particularly the Navy, uh, uh, they're also diplomats. You guys are all diplomats. And, and just because you, you spent 11 years at sea doesn't mean you're any less of a diplomat. Look at you here today. You're a total diplomat, James, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so one, one other thing is, you know, as you, as you move ahead um, with, with, the, uh, with, with RIMPAC and the number of ships and countries involved, um, the, you know, the basic um, direction of the military is better technology, much of which is classified. So 26 uh, ships and maybe 30 next time, um, more, more technology, more classified technology, better technology, and more people who you know, can observe it. And you don't want everybody to know everything. So how do you protect the technology of one country against observation uh, by another in, in the context of RIMPAC? That's a really good question. Uh... So what I will highlight here is, so for, for RIMPAC 2022, it was the first time we had our uh, MQ-9s, which are our unmanned um, vehicles. Uh, we also had our unmanned surface vehicles as well. Uh, and a lot of that technology is in fact classified uh, and, and caveated to either US or to a limited distribution out. Uh, so we get around that or we get through that uh, by what we call white carding a lot of the information. So uh, for a country, uh, a country may request a, an effect or, hey, can I get a, an asset to be able to look at this particular piece of the ocean um, or, or try and find this particular unit? Um, and from an MQ-9 perspective, we can say, yes, we can task the MQ-9 to get out there and do that. The intricacies of the information that comes through and the, the various pipelines that, that it takes to get there are transparent to the partner nations that are requesting that because that stuff holds a, a security classification. So what we don't want to do is say, no, you can't have it. We just work really hard um, through whole of defence, um, so all of our departments um, within defence, to get to yes, um, even if it is just in limited capacity. Um, the other side I'll say to that is for our unmanned surface units that we've had out here, uh, even more so. Uh, so. So tasking them and, and getting information from them, uh, a lot of that white card or that, that transparency happens in the background, but we're still able to protect the sovereignty of the unit that's here or the country that operates it while still providing that information through too. Yeah, one thing that strikes me is uh, this is this is there's a lesson here, and that is uh, not all of, of high tech comes from the United States. Some high tech is developed elsewhere. And I know it is developed in Australia because the very program that we are broadcasting on, which is called vMix, 
uh, is a program that's developed and very successful globally, developed in Australia. So we know you guys have information technology and we like it a lot. After a global search, we found an Australian product that does our heavy lifting. So that's great. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> James Dobson, Lieutenant Lieutenant Commander in the Australian Navy, joining us today to talk about RIMPAC. Thank you so much. Uh, that was very educational and uh, encouraging. Uh, thank you so much for appearing on Think Tech. Thanks so much for having me this afternoon, James. Much appreciated. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.